Hello, and welcome to today's Quick Plays video on the science of Ace-King. Ace-King is a hand that players either seem to love or hate, but either way this should be one of the biggest winning hands in your database. In this video we'll analyze how Ace-King hits flops and begin to understand the true versatility of this hand. For this video we're going to use the tool Flopzilla. This is a paid piece of software that you can pick up from Flopzilla.com, and I've done an extensive video using this software as well. I'll leave a link for that video in the description box. In Flopzilla, we can plug in a single hand on the left, and we get a full breakdown on how that hand hits the flop on the right. So let's get to work. Let's start by plugging in Ace-King Offsuit on the left. We notice that it smashes the flop about 4% of the time with two pair or better. It flops top pair 29% of the time, and whether the flop is Ace-XX or King-XX, it's always top pair top kicker. It flops a gut shot 11% of the time, and all of those will contain either a pair or one or two overcards. And we see Ace-King flops Ace-High the majority of the time at 67%. If we switch over to Ace-King suited for a moment, we notice that it smashes the flop just a hair more often at 4.6%. It flops top pair the same 29% of the time, and gut shots the same 11% of the time. But because it's a suited hand, it now flops a flush draw 11% of the time, which will always be a nut flush draw. And lastly, the hand misses the flop 66% of the time, almost the exact same as Ace-King offsuit. Let's talk about single pairs for a moment. Ace-King in general flops a single pair 29% of the time. All of those pairs are going to be top pair top kicker, which means a couple of things. One, single pairs with Ace-King are inherently very strong. Two, single pairs with Ace-King don't need to worry about overcards in the turn or river. And three, when Ace-King flops a single pair, the flop usually looks like a standard seabed type of board. These points may seem basic, but they are oftentimes overlooked. For instance, if you take a situation where you 3-bet with Ace-King and Villain Calls, and then you c-bet on an Ace-9-4 flop, many opponents assume you're c-bet that flop every time. Of course, Ace-King won't hit the flop every time. In fact, it misses the flop on average two-thirds the time. This is very standard for hands with unpaired Broadway cards, so knowing how to play the hand when it misses the flop is crucial. Now there's a difference between missing with Ace-King on a Queen-9-5 flop or an 8-3 deuce flop. But many times when Ace-King misses, the board will be lower, and it will be obvious that Ace-King didn't improve. But even when Ace-King misses the flop, it still usually has some equity. When it has 6 outs going into the turn, it'll turn a top pair about 12% of the time. If Ace-King has 6 outs and expects to see both the turn and river, it will improve the top pair almost a quarter of the time. These are important considerations to keep in mind. Going back to preflop though, Ace-King is a hand I suggest playing aggressively far more often than you play it passively. I enter pots with raises when holding Ace-King, 3-bet it as a default, and look for spots to 4-bet and 5-bet with it. But why? When I see a student 3-bet with Ace-King, I always ask them for their reasoning. Usually they respond with, I'm 3-betting for value. But let's quickly look at the equity of Ace-King versus some common ranges and see if it's actually for value. Flopzilla actually has another awesome functionality, where we can plug in a hand versus a range and see equities, flop percentages, etc. So on the right we're plugging Ace of Diamonds, King of Spades, and on the left we're plugging a strong range of 10s plus Ace King. If we were to 3-bet Ace King and Villain would only continue with 10s plus Ace King, he has a 60-40 equity edge and flops the best hand 54% of the time. That doesn't sound like a value 3-bet to me. If we widen Villain's continuance range to 8s plus, Ace Queen plus, we still don't have an equity edge. We will flop the best hand about 35% of the time, but again, this still isn't a value 3-bet in the sense that we don't have an equity edge. Sure, we get Villain to fold some hands pre-flop, like Ace Jack and King Queen, but those are hands that we beat, and by 3-betting we simply get him to fold his equity share. Ace King doesn't actually have a decent equity edge until Villain continues with 7s plus, Ace Jack plus, King Queen which means that if Villain is fishier, or simply doesn't like folding versus 3-bets, our 3-bet with Ace-King can certainly be for value. It also means that we need Villain to continue kind of wide, and with hands that we dominate. Whether that's with Ace-Jack or 4-betting bluffs, we just need him to continue with those second best hands often enough to make a 3-bet with Ace-King a value 3-bet, rather than just a semi-bluff. Aggression with Ace-King overall is just a good idea. It gives us the chance to pick up the pot outright preflop, if Villain calls our 3-bet we can use our initiative to apply pressure postflop, possibly get him to fold out the same hand postflop, and our hand has decent equity going postflop against most reasonable ranges. 
it's just always a good idea to know why you are 3-betting or 4-betting to ensure it's actually going to be the best line. As always, the goal isn't to tell you how to play ace-king in 100% of situations. It's to help you understand how the hand hits flops and how the hand tends to play best. There are times when I'll just call an open raise or call a 3-bet with ace-king, but it's always with a plan. And even when I 3-bet with ace-king, I still have a plan on how I'm going to react against a 4-bet. But knowing how the hand hits and the kinds of equity it has versus ranges can help you take much better lines with this tricky hand. Same as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. Otherwise, good luck and happy grinding.